Hey everybody, uh, uh, welcome to Hey Man, I'm Josh. I am Jacob. Hey man. Hey man. How are you? I'm great. It's weird sitting uh, next, next to you and not across from you. It really is bananas. But it's a very special occasion. We're very excited and I will take it sitting next to you because we have an amazing guest. Here we do. In so the studio. For, for those of you, first of all, let's get business out of the way. Um, thank you guys so much for this weekend in Buffalo. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. The energy, all five shows. That was one of my favorite weekends I think I've uh, I've ever done, ever. Whether yeah. it was doing stand up or not, just going on the road. Buffalo, Bills Mafia came out and showed out, and we loved you guys. Thank you for coming out. It was energy. It was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. I'll tell you, maybe the most amazing part of the weekend is that it was warmer in Buffalo than it was in Las Vegas. That's true. That was a little weird. Yep. Especially considering how I packed. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I I overpacked. So much. Mm -hmm. And also considering that, what, two weeks ago, their whole city was under snow? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good Lord. So, but anyways, thank you guys so much. Uh, a huge uh, pile of gratitude coming your way, not just for this weekend, but for the incredible energy that is uh, um, behind us right now, behind the stand-up, behind the podcast. So thank you all so much. We have some amazing things coming down the road. We're going to be in Denise Beach, Florida. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So by the time this comes out, it'll just be Friday and Saturday. But we're in Dania Beach this week. And then check it out, comedianjoshwolf.com for tour dates. I'm not going to get into too much business um, because this is our officially our first episode of, of, a get, of having a guest. And um, the idea that Jacob and I, and Jacob, I'm wondering this out loud. Okay. If we look at each other during the edits, Matt, will that look weird? Should we, so we should, instead of talking to each other like this. Talk to camera. We should talk to each other still like we're across the table from each other. That's weird. Right? It is weird. You should stop turning in your seat. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this is our first episode where we're going to have a guest. Jacob and I want to start bringing guests on maybe once or twice a month. Um, and where we talk to them um, about their childhood, um, how their childhood shaped who they became. And then uh, their parenting style and maybe just looking back on how they parent or in, our, in this case right now, how they, how they did parent or I don't know how to put that, no, it's but uh, still we, it, we're still, we're, we're going to find exactly how this is going to go. But um, I thought it would be very interesting for a father and son because we're going to have different questions. Yeah, definitely. Um, and because we'll have different perspectives about um, what we're curious about. So I thought, but what better way to start this off um, than to have uh, my dad be on the very first episode of the Hey Man interview, the which the we still want to change to Generation Wolf? Yeah, I mean, look, if you look at calling it Generation Wolf right now, we have three Generation of Wolves sitting at the same table. The legend himself, Tom Wolf, is here. Hey! What's up, man? You don't remember? People wanted to see me and mom. Yeah. And we had, I remember. We had, we had a podcast. We had three. I do remember. We started out only wanting one and other people wanted more. Yep. You remember mom started the first one sitting way behind me. Yeah. <laughs> and by the third one, she started the whole podcast off sitting next to me. She's not, she doesn't love being on camera, I don't think. I'm trying to figure out if I do. <laughs> I'm, not so, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm getting. Yeah. I mean, listen, you don't have to love it. You just have to be here for an hour. Yeah. Right. That's, and you know, it's just talking to us. We're just having, you know, some fun family conversations, just like we would at a, at a dinner table. That's yeah, right. Uh, with microphones. And camera. Yeah. And camera. earphones. Yep. And camera. We don't usually do that. Well, I not, do not, record not every conversation yeah, at dinner. Yeah. You just don't know. <laughs> I was telling the story the other night, by the way, on stage about how when Caitlin was young, she, when we would go out to dinner, I didn't know this until like, do you know, she used to take the gum off the bottom of the table because she thought it was the gum that the restaurant left. Yep. Ugh. Ew. Yeah. yeah. Um, but That's let's start cool. off, dad. First of all, I think I'm going to start these podcasts 
by giving people their flowers. Um, and I want you to know, like when I was younger, I don't think you, uh, I don't think you, most of the times you really, um, appreciate your parents until you have kids or at least until you get old, you know? It, at least until you find yourself doing exactly what they did to you. Exactly. To your kids. Exactly. Then. You appreciate, you're like, oh, this parenting thing is really just people doing the best they can. Yep. And that the the best you can doesn't always jive with what your kids want, but that's not always what's best for them. And a lot of times as a parent, you don't fucking know what's going to be best. You're just going on instinct. You just have to, like when we took him out of Notre Dame, his school, that was Beth and I just going on instinct. Like we have to make a decision here of what we think is best. And there's no way to tell. So let me just, never mind. Let me just tell you that when I was a kid, and I would say, and I don't think you would, this would be a huge bone of contention. Like a, a very overly emotional, emoting person is not something that you have ever been or were when we were kids. And I think as a kid, I didn't, I didn't quite understand. I was like, well, that's how people show emotion. So that must be how someone shows love, right? As I've gotten old, as I got older and I realized that, do you know what you did? that I don't remember any other parent doing. You showed up at everything. You were at every game and you were at every, everything. And as I got older, I realized one, how difficult that is to do, but also, but that at the time, I would say you, especially now, as you got older, emotions are a little easier, or I don't know if you made a concerted effort, or I don't know if something happened in your life, but that, that there are a lot of different ways that you can show love. And as a young person, I thought it just, you showed it by the words that came out of your mouth and you showed it a lot by being there 100% of the time. And I want, I want, I want to acknowledge that I realize now how difficult that is how important it was. I, I, I write in a journal now and every day in the journal, I write in my journal, how grateful I am for you and mom, not just the amount of love, unconditional love and support I've felt for my entire life. It's hard to, it's hard to appreciate. It's hard to put into words as I look back, how monumental that has been for me, especially in the career path that I chose. And so I just, I, I want to make sure that when I start these podcasts with other people that I want to, I, I want to just give people their flowers right up front and let you, I just want you to know that like, it took me a little while to understand it or appreciate it, but uh, could not be more appreciative for both what you and mom and the way you parented and how much you've been there 100% for my entire life. You gave opinions and sometimes you didn't agree, but not agreeing and not supporting were two different things. So it was like, I don't agree with this. This is not what I would do. If this is what you're doing, we got your back. And so super important. I just want to say, love you so much. And thank you so much for all of that. I don't know who I would be. Uh, if I had had two different people running the show. So here will be a semi-long response. First, thank you. Second, um, you, I'm sure you know it by now, your parents are in, introverts. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and we... We, that's okay. That could, that could, that could have been in self-defense. Yeah. But, um, oh yeah. Interesting. But I've always felt that your actions speak 
louder than the words. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there is a picture of me that's in our bedroom now. Um, I wouldn't have put it there, but mom made sure it got there. Is I, at three years old, was wearing the same size glasses. Yeah. And there's a picture of me sitting, you know, designed a portrait in those days. And you can tell that that person there is inside, but he's not going to be outside a lot. Yeah. And um, as a side, you know, I finished my work life in a position where I had to speak. I know. Um, which was a bit of a wrench. But the one thing that is interesting, and you you should know this already because when you are in a situation where you're required to speak, okay, it was safe for me to do that, mm -hmm. right? I think you'll find lots of actors tell you that they may be introverts as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when they get on the stage, it's a safe space. There are rules. Um, and they do that, but I think you're right. Um, there was one year, Jake, mm. where Adam and Danny and my two older Jonathan brothers, and all three of my older brothers, Josh, were playing in on three different baseball teams. Mm. Okay, Nana, mm -hmm. Nana. And my dad's I mom were working full time. Oh, Nana, you talking about grandma? Yeah, His grandma. Oh, grandma. grandma. Okay, so my grandma and my grandpa mom. Yep, were working full time in jobs that required a great deal of time. Fifty games. There, there. We did not miss a game. Yeah. Not the two of us. You know, when I was coaching, okay, it was easy for me to right. make make all those, but all 50 games, there was one or two of us there. Yeah. It's remarkable, dude. It's amazing. And, and for me, like it, you instilling that in, in, in my, and you know, your son and my dad, I mean, even though like growing up, you know, again, we've talked about it before is, you know, I, I, I never, I never took anything personally because during high school, you know, you had to, you had to not only bring home the bacon, but you were chasing a dream. It's something that you had wanted for, for such a long time. And you were still there uh, in spirit. Mom would FaceTime you. But again, there was always one person who was at every event. Yeah, between whether your it mom was and I. Between yeah. someone. And, you know, it was, it was always there. And so I will just thank you and Grandma for that, for instilling that in, in him and them. And uh, it, it always showed me that there was someone there and it was always super important to see just somebody showing up. Showing up is so important. Yep. Yeah. Showing up is so important. Well, I mean, you know, uh, a great movie where the, the guy who is a young adult and completely irresponsible learns that showing up and support. What movie are we talking about? Forget a baseball. I think it's Cusack, the younger, when he was younger. <clears throat> When he was younger, yeah. Um, the other thing that um, I was is that you are responsible for what you do. Of and, course, mm -hmm. um, well, you know, <laughs> a lot of people don't feel that they are. A lot of people feel that it's somebody else's fault. Yeah, but you told. I mean, and then we'll get into the interview part. Yeah. But in general, the parent, you know, I remember asking you once when he was in school, grade school, I was like, what do you think the difference is really between teaching now? And you said, well, when I was teaching a parent teacher conference, the parent and the kid would come in. And if the kid was getting a C, the parent and the teacher would say to the kid, why are you getting a C? Now, the teacher sits in front of a parent who says, why are you giving my kid a C? <laughs> and so like, it's the kids, it's the teacher's responsibility and not the kids. 
And it was such an interesting thing. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The there's no sense of, oh, it's the kid's responsibility. You're taking all of the all of that off of the child and putting it onto the kid. No responsibility or accountability. Accountability. That's what's right. going on. Yeah. The, um, there's a theory called attribution theory. And essentially when you when you break it out, it is asking somebody to what do you attribute your success, failure, this or that? In other words, I, and it's done years ago, but in the United States, if the kids failed, the teacher didn't teach us this. I was sick. Um, the light was bad. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, there was an eclipse, whatever. In Japan, the kid said, I did this. Yeah. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Or here's how, um, whether it's good or bad. I, you know. You but your, your, your accountability, and this is across the board, it requires you to look at yourself. And most people don't want to do that. No. Um, all right. So here's how I think we see this going. And we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about your childhood. Uh, you, you know, how you grew up, where you grew up, who is in the family, your relationships with them and all that stuff. And then we'll kind of slowly at somewhere where we feel is the right point. We'll try to walk it over into when I was a kid and you as a parent. And we'll see how that feels. Yeah. 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 I think we'll just, we'll just play it off of. Because look, I mean, we have tons of questions, but I think yep. we'll base it off of where it is and and how we think is a good digression into the next section. Okay, so tell me. So first, I got to say, Matt, yeah. do you realize that I'm not going to have to pay for this psychoanalysis session? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You're not going to have to. No, it's this free. Is free. Yeah. yeah, it is free. It's a free hour. Sure. By the way, uh, if I was charging somebody to analyze their brains, they're paying too much, and I don't even know how much they're paying. <laughs> So <laughs> this is, I would feel bad if I was charging somebody to be like, I'm going to get into your brain. They'd, probably not the best move. Yeah. I, I'm not the guy for that. But no, no, you're not. Here's, let's just start with this. What year were you born? Where did you grow up? Y y your mom and dad were married for um, um, their whole lives. You had one brother, just going to give us the rundown of what the deal is, right? Isn't that right up top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. Okay. Um, Mary, Mary, born in 1937, mm -hmm. um, grew up in Boston, which explains the hat. Mm -hmm. um, we grew up in a suburb of Boston, we're really right close. Um, where we could, what, kids could walk over um, around the seventh inning to the Boston Braves. Shows you how old. Uh, and this is pre-Red pre, pre -Red Sox? No, pre -Red, with Red Sox. Red Sox. Yeah. The reason the Braves were up the trolley car line was the Red Sox wouldn't let them in to their park. But it, my, mom's dad, like my... So grandpa, my grandpa, yeah. he made baseball gloves for the Boston Braves. Yep. Okay. Um, he, he had a manufacturing factory. Yeah. Uh, and, um, did you guys grow up with money? No. And, uh, um, at what point do you, did you, did, did Nana and Papa start to have a little bit of money? How old my were you? dad, mm -hmm. okay, um, was the very youngest of three sons, yep. 10 years younger than the middle one. Uh, mistake, I guess. Um, <laughs> that, yep. Hilarious. Yeah. yeah. In okay. those I'm, days, it was easy to make. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, I'm sure and his two it, older brothers reminded him. The, the, anyway, so. Um, it wasn't until I was just starting college that he actually 
found his way. I mean, his dad, there's a story for you about his dad. Okay. The two older brothers, Junior and Bob, were hellions. Okay. Uh, they didn't like their piano teacher and they didn't want to stop lessons. So the, one day they, she came in to give them a lesson and they mooned her. <laughs> And that was that. No anyway, problem, that yeah. gives you an idea of their growing up. Anyway, um, their dad, my paternal grandfather, pulled his three sons out of Harvard, MIT, and for my dad, Yale, to come to work for him in a clothing store. Wow. So that was in their blood. Okay, so dad did that, you know, getting by for a long time. When I was in this starting college, I think, he got the idea for the prep shop. Prep shop was a clothing store. Okay. We talked about it with Adam last time we saw him. Okay. Yeah. Six and sizes six and 20. For you folks out there who have kids, fit, fit boys, you'll understand. Sizes six to 20. Um, and in Harvard Square, there was no place for boys to get dressed. Mm -hmm. It was an instant success. They did a few things that made them very successful. Where'd they get the money to start the store? Maternal grandfather, Dickie Ackerman, Patty, Ruth. Okay. So the people in the, the family. The family banded together and set him up. Uh, and it was a success. Amazing. Uh, um, and it was such a success that kids would come in at sizes, you know, below 10, go right through and then ask, they start to ask dad, mom, uh, why don't you have some men's sizes? So literally the demand of the satisfied customers push that store out into men's sizes. Yeah. Mm. Did, did, and did, how did your life, and then we should, we should get back because they didn't get, they didn't have money until you were older, but how did that, did that change? You, were you already out of the house when they started to get a little bit of money? Yes, yeah, Steve was in the house, but the, they didn't, you couldn't tell they had money. Right. Okay. Right. Even when they were earning a decent, the store was earning a decent living. You couldn't tell. Okay. They joined a country club to play golf. Yeah. That was it. Okay. All right. What do you got? Um, uh, did he kind of answer this for himself about you as a, uh, about viewing you as a parent, but was there, did you have a view of your parents when you were a kid and did that change as you got older? And if so, like, how did that view change? It, yeah. And maybe what were your mom and dad's roles? Everybody gets a little bit of a role as a parent. I don't imagine that Papa was much of a disciplinarian. <laughs> yeah. Mom, I, mom was the disciplinarian. Nana. Yeah. For sure, I could see her being a disciplinarian. So now I'm going to say something, and there are going to be people who are watching this who will say, oh, my God, I must have scarred you forever. Yeah. Okay? Um, I'm here to tell you it didn't. Times were different. No. Um, Mother was different. Yes. Okay. So she would, we would get spanked <laughs> from mom. If I, I look for, you know, like Br'er Rabbit said, don't throw me in the briar patch. Bed. Yeah. I, you know, I, I look forward to my dad's spank. Probably hurt, truly hurt her more than it hurt me. Who, Papa? Yeah. Oh. So. <sighs> so. S such we, amazing. For me. I know you've told me that he had some depression, but for me, that's not anything I remember about him. He worked to get through and the prep shop got him through. Mm, so his depression was pre me. Oh, way pre you. Got it. Probably pre me too. Okay. Um, he used to go in here. He was an incredible musician. Okay. Mm -hmm. he would go in 
after supper in the dark and play. You know. Just play. Not songs and music came out. Mm-hmm. And um, I would go in in the dark and listen. To sit. So k- tell me, keep going about about Papa. I'm sorry, in the spanking and Nana and the disciplinarian. So I did something. We got spanked. Steve and I got spanked. We got slapped. Dad, Dad spanked us, which was, you know, we could have had six layers of clothing on. <laughs> Wouldn't have made any difference. Yeah. Or no layers of clothing. Yeah. So I am in high school. And she's going to slap me. And the, the, Nana. Nana. And the, well, let's explain how big Nana is. Nana. <laughs> right. The first. Was she 5'2"? Maybe. If she was standing on a cushion <laughs> yeah. that she used to drive the car. Yeah. We yeah. got her a cushion. I remember. Yeah. Well, but Steve and I went out to visit her, visit Bibi once the mm-hmm. Papa died. Bibi yeah. is my but, dad's grandmother. And she goes to get the car. We're going someplace. And she comes driving around in the place. And you can see this. <laughs> Her hands on the wheel. I mean, her head below the steering well, wheel. She could see out, you know, the <laughs> through the steering wheel hole. Yeah. <laughs> so she had a dead, she had a line straight off the hood. That's her line of sight. Oh my God. <laughs> that is amazing. I can see it too because we got too. curly orange uh, hair just sticking up. No, no, no. That, this, was a, this was my grandma. Oh, oh this baby. Um, yeah. This baby. So, but Steve and I looked at each other and said, she got out of the car. We got in. The first thing we did was get her a cushion. I yeah. said, you're not driving this. Before. We're not going home before we have a line of sight test. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that is so funny. I'm going to stand in front of the car, a grown human. <laughs> Can you see me yeah. right now? A bit, you know, it, as, as long as you're, you were over the hood, yes. five feet away, she could see you. Right. Um, anyway, so. We're standing in my bedroom, and she goes to slap me. And quick reflexes, she gets about halfway there, and I go, pump, like this. Mm. And she, here, whack. With the other With hand? With the other hand. No, no. It goes right in. It looks like this. It's dead silent. Now, what shows that the, the relationship was good was we both burnt, burst out laughing. Hilarious. That's really funny. It, it yeah, good laugh. We finished laughing. She said, now keep your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> she and, said, that was all good fun. Now let me and, get mine. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. Some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is awesome. Well, can I ask you, Dad, if you were spanked and slapped, how come that didn't translate to when you were, and it, and it was something that didn't, I, should, I don't know if didn't bother is the right word, but just was what it was. How come that's something that didn't, and I'm not complaining, but how come that's something that did not happen when we were kids? Was that something that you and mom had talked about together? And you, did mom get spanked? Was were, no. I can't imagine grandpa. But she, you know, if she were here, I would give her a chance to answer that. Um, she got what was way worse from her mom. Well, both of your moms must have been the disciplinarians. There's no way grandpa or papa, <laughs> two of the nicest. And I, when I say gentlemen, that's what that, that generation of men, they were gentlemen, true gentlemen. Some of them. Art Stern, those three guys. Gentlemen. You know, you know, decent. Yes. To the core. I agree. Um, but mom didn't get, didn't get spanked. But uh, having, getting Beth. To my mom's mom berate you to the ground. Yes. Okay. That went on. Spanking was hit, gone, forgotten. Don't do that again. Interesting. Um, because one actually probably lingered in you longer. Exactly. Yeah, because it's it's if it's if it's like a constant berating, it's something that you won't forget. Those words are constantly in the back of your head, yeah. type stuff. I it, also it imagine that that kind of berating affects how you feel about yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, you'd have to have mom in here yeah, to talk that. about it. I'm not going to talk about it. But, but, okay. Um, 
How come that didn't translate? Like, why was, was that a decision, a conscious decision that you and mom made? Here, your arm keeps getting in the shot. So. Oh, sorry. Yep. Is that a conscious decision that you and mom made that you talked about? You never had to talk about? Like, why? I don't think we had to talk about it. We, we, um, you raise kids. You understand that. I don't know if you understand that, Matt. Matt has kids. Matt has yeah. kids. Okay. If I'm off the track, just let me know, either one of you. But one of the most important things for us was if we believed in something strongly, okay, ethically, okay, um, slapping wasn't going to get at that, okay? Um, what does that prove? It doesn't prove anything. All the kid learns is not to get caught doing whatever that is. That's it's funny Whoa. that you say that. It is exactly why I never went to fear for discipline or parenting. It, fear every now and then. Like if I needed to, like when I needed to scare him about predators and being too nice to people, I went fear. But parenting, I never thought because fear makes for sneaky people. When you're, you know what I mean? If I, you, if you're scared of the parent, that doesn't lend itself to that person coming to you for anything. Mm -hmm. Because there's, I don't know, you guys know about fear. It, it's not, it doesn't build confidence. And so uh, that's interesting. That is exactly why I never lean towards that either. Now, the other thing is, okay, um, if, if you are, an ethical person. If you are believe, if you believe that you owe it to other people as well as yourself to be able to look in the mirror and see who you are, okay, then you're going to approach things a little differently. Um, and the one thing that's that I tell teachers, or I tell parents, or I tell people. If you believe in something, don't drop it the first negative feedback you get or the first time you fail. Mm -hmm. Do not drop that, okay? Because then you're going to punish the other person for your mistakes or not believing. If you believe in something strongly enough, you hang in there with mm -hmm. it, okay? Um you know, sometimes you would think, or I would think, um, is this going to happen when they get old? You know what I would say? Yeah. And, and one of the interesting things, Jacob, um, is that one time or another in each one of the four boys' lives. Four boys meaning me and my three brothers. They have told me or Grandma mm -hmm. something that has shown us that they are willing to take responsibility for their actions. They are not attributed to anybody else. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think all four of us do actually. They've said so. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, do you, um, by the way, just jump in. Yeah, no, I just, okay. there's always like, you guys are, there's, it, it's never like really a good time for me to, and, and, and I understand like, and also, Truthfully, like since you and I talk every week, I'm trying not to look directly at you and yeah, I'm me trying too. to look yeah, at the yeah, camera. Too, yeah. Um truthfully, since dad, since you and I talk every week, like you and I have been able to have these kind of conversations about like you and I and how you raised me and like my perspective as as the kid. And in all honesty, like I'm gonna get my questions in, but I, I really like watching you and your dad talk because I assume you guys have maybe chatted about it before, but this is like really the first time that I'm getting to see this father son dynamic in 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 a different light so i'm also just like it's i haven't stopped smiling since this started because i'm just like i'm really enjoying just kind of watching you guys chat um i will tell you jacob that 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 it it is it, it's one of for me like this podcast with you is 
not only just entertaining and fun for me, but it really fills me up in a way that I did not imagine it could have. When we have conversations, you know, there's obviously things, I don't know for you or mom, but for me, there are some things that I feel guilty about, about the kids' childhoods in general. They're unavoidable, right? And um, he and I have had a chance to discuss those things where I've been like, hey, I feel guilty about this. I'm really sorry that this happened. And it's been great to be able to say that and have him go, let me off the hook and be like, that's a you thing. I don't think about that at all. Or, or if I had thought about it, this, this, it's been, so this has been like a really fulfilling podcast for me on, on, on many levels, you know? Um, Uh, Are you you good? Yeah. I do have a question. I'm sorry to cut you off. Mm -hmm. Uh, Grandpa, growing up in, in a, you know, in a different generation and how your parents raised you, how did your childhood and, and that family dynamic and your parents raising you, how did it, how did it shape you and, and help you choose like what you ended up doing in your career? Like, did they influence you in any way or was it just more of something that you found on your own? This is hard to answer without people getting the idea that I'm going through my life blowing my own horn. Okay. okay. By the way, that is the furthest thing from something that you do. You, I mean, yeah, they, it, ever. If there's anybody, but you and mom, there's anybody that it, that is not a characteristic. That is the mm-hmm. two of you. Okay, but now you need a couple stories. When I was growing up, but here's a perfect story. Um, Mom and Dad are away, and BB is babysitting. BB and Bob, they're okay. Babysitting is not quite the word for it. Uh, Steve is five, and he's going to kindergarten. Steve is your brother. brother. Yeah, right. Okay. Okay. So, BB takes me to the, and the teacher they're asking, and I say something, and it's wrong, okay, but it's. The conversation was, mother asked their mom, why did you say something like that? Because a, a date or something. Mm-hmm. All right. And Bibi turns to mother and says, well, Tom said it and it must be right. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up with that. You grew up in a very supportive household also, yes? Yeah, but... Also, you take responsibility for your actions. Was that more Nana? Yeah, of course. And she was, my grandmother was very straightforward, honest, uh, honest for sure. And I would say kind, but not at the fault of being nice. Right. Interesting. Absolutely. That's an interesting way to put that. Yeah. She did, she it's something that I'm really working on myself personally right now. The difference between respecting yourself and being kind to people, but not, that doesn't mean nice. And she was kind and respected herself and her family. Nana also instilled a fierce, um, family, like family was so important to your mom. Do you know when we went down to take pictures in Florida, Jacob, we would take family pictures, but then everybody who didn't have blood wolf stepped out of the picture. That's, <laughs> that's my, that's my mom. That's Beth, your mom, mm-hmm. any spouse, anybody that wasn't blood wolf, she differentiated. You were not in that fucking picture. The, it, it was, and it wasn't her, it wasn't like trying to offend. It's just, she was, she had this very, strong sense of how fa- how important family is. Right. She she also grew up um across the river from Kentucky. Yeah. And she was racist pretty much. She wasn't you're not a human being racist. Yes. But she was racist. Well, you remember the conversations that we had with her about Jonathan's only ever dated black girls. Yeah. And so this is the right that she, she, I remember, 
and relax, everybody. But I remember her saying to me and trying to be nice about it, is Jonathan bringing the colored girl to dinner? And I was like, don't say that at dinner. Can't do that. That's not a dinner conversation. She was like, why? I didn't say. I'm like, don't say that either. Neither one of those. We're past both of those yeah. words. <laughs> but, but I will say this about her. And I agree with that. But she really tried. She, it's, she wasn't so set in her ways where she was like, times are changing. I may need to change a little bit too. Absolutely. Jacob, when grandma and I wanted to get married, mom, mother, who insisted on being called mother, stepped in. Oh, you're not doing that now. Um, and yet when she died, um, <laughs> Steve and I swear she loved Ellen's mom more than she loved us. Yeah. <laughs> that I love li- that. That relationship <laughs> was amazing. Amazing. Yeah. That is awesome. Um, so, I, yes. I, 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 can I tell you something else? What I loved about Nana is she would say to mom, show off your figure. She always said, if I had a figure like that, she, it was so... It was so interesting because mom's not that, not a, I don't remember what seeing my mom put on a stitch of makeup. Never. And Ned, your, Nana, your great, great Nana was convinced and she talked to me about it, that I must not love her because I picked somebody who <laughs> never wore <laughs> makeup, who never, and, yeah. and I'm think, thinking, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. that, but yeah, um, no. Their relationship had, was amazing. It really was incredible. Yeah. I, I, yeah, amazing. So, so, so with how you were raised and with those morals, what, what did you, did you, for your career, what did you end up doing? Did you have a plan and you went somewhere else with it? Like how, how were you influenced as a kid to choose your career path? Okay. I'm going to send you something to read. But I'll, Which won't help our listeners. That's correct. So, yeah. <laughs> so we'll, so we'll abridge it. Okay. 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 So Do you I'm want me good. to tell you what a bridge means? Com, com, combine or, or yeah, yeah, a bridge. It's just like a, a bridge, but together. You know, that's combine. right. Yeah. We'll get to one side to yeah. the other. Context quicker. clues. Okay. Good for you. Um, so anyway, I was going to be a doctor. Um, I had nothing but unparalleled success as a student. All right. He. All right. He's very smart. Wicked <laughs> smart. Okay. So, um, but I didn't get into medical school. I go to a very prestigious, prestigious school. Um, I was, nobody had, you know, I learned my lesson. I learned an important lesson about myself uh, and the world. The hard way. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I didn't get into med school. The long part of the story I'm not going to get into, but there were two English teachers in high school who, when I look back on it, taught me a lot about being human and people. And the senior that, when I was <laughs> senior in high school, I was sitting in an AP class. Minding my own business with, you know, 20, 18 other people. And I hear Tom go get book covers. And book covers in those days were brown paper and you. Yeah. Yeah. So I go in, we were in the English department book closet was next door. I look around, no book covers. I come back and sit down. And so Mr. Rinker, halfway through something, they we're introducing something, suddenly realized that nobody's putting book covers on. And he says, hey, Tom, I sent you to get book covers. And I said, well, there weren't any. And the guy could go from zero to 100 in about this much time. And he exploded. What do you mean? You leave this. You do not come back until you have book covers. And as I'm walking out the door, he says, we will build no monuments to Mr. Wolf. 
<laughs> so there are three, there are three buildings, three buildings in the high school. It's a big school. Uh -huh. Okay. We graduated about 800 kids. Okay. So you multiplied that by however many. 3,200. Yeah. All right. Ah, so I head big over school. to, I go over to the main office, no book up. So where they have book covers are in English classes or classes in general. Mm -hmm. So I start building three, walk in the door, no book covers. Classes are going on now. I walk over to where the, in every room in building three and in building two, no book covers. I'm walking right in the interrupting classes. So I finally get to a room where they have book covers. I very carefully count out the number of book covers I need. And I come in the door with the book covers. Silence. So I go up and down the aisle, giving each person personally their own book cover. And I had one left over for Rinker. That's his name. And I got up and half in jest and half seriously got down on one knee and offered the book cover to him. <laughs> and there was silence again, but he laughed. Okay, so that was the kind of guy he was. It, when I had gotten um, refused at all the med school, I went back to visit him, and I walk into his office. And before I can say anything, he said, oh, he didn't know. Okay. Oh, you're just in time for to start the AP's class I'm, you know, on the Scarlet Letter. Do you know that book? You probably didn't have to read that in yeah, high school, yeah. did you? No. And then again, all the books we had to read in high school, I didn't read anyways. So. Yes, That's great. So anyway, I, you know, teach? Oh, my God, scared. But I, I comforted myself as I was walking down the hall. There were two things I had never taught before. And I had never said no to Mr. Rinker before. And I don't think anybody ever did. Yeah, but dad, how do you reconcile being an introvert and then being an English teacher? Remember what I said at the beginning. Okay. You can see certain areas, even though it's a risk to teach, just like it's a risk to be where you, you know, you've got a different persona or it's, it's what you're supposed to do. You see it's, it as a safe space. That's yeah. interesting. You know what? You remember Dash, our friend Dash? Yeah. A Dash is an actor, everybody. Dash Myhawk. You know, Dash has Tourette's, but when he acts, he doesn't. Exactly. Yeah, I talked to Dad. Um, so, um, I, I did comfort myself. You know, I chose between, I uh, decided to try to teach versus trying to say no to Mr. Rinker. So I went in there. Class was very successful. I found that my brain moves pretty quickly. So if I was listening, I could hear what the kids were saying. And that was it. Um, he had gotten involved with um, Harvard <laughs> in an experimental teaching prep program. Would I like to do that? And the answer is yes. And that's it. Can I ask, um, because when we first moved to Amherst, mm -hmm. and that was in Boston, everybody. When we first moved to Amherst, we moved not for a job, right? Didn't we move for school, for you to do your doctorate, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and when we first, so, I, I, I guess I've never asked you this, but the time, and by the way, anything during this podcast, because it's not live, if any, anything that you're like, yeah, I don't want to talk about that, we just cut it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, there was a point where you didn't work. I did work. I got a, okay, I don't know, Matt, but the way in which graduate students themselves is we did those um no that was something else oh. but 
the way in which graduate schools, graduate students support themselves is they get grants, they, they do the paper correcting, you know, they do teaching for a professor, okay? And that usually, um, so yeah, I had a professor, I had an assistantship and mom got a job the year after, as you would expect. The, the, do you think there was a shift? Because then eventually when I was probably sophomore or freshman in college, and we'll go back, I'm jumping ahead, but we'll go back. Well, I mean, like we should. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I, because uh, at Danny and Adam would say, oh, you had a dad, when dad got that job in South Hadley, he, he changed a little bit. Do you feel like, like that, I mean, that was that you think that was their perspective from outside? I think I probably didn't realize in the way in which I changed, but the stuff I did as a graduate student for the School of Education yeah. was pretty important. Um, but, you know, it wasn't very, the pay was little, and mom earned most of the money that right. the family used. Um, was one more fulfilling for you than the other or not? No, I think they were all, my work has been super interesting for me. Yeah. No, I, I, I am, I am, uh, and always was very, cause you, even after you retired, you volunteered at high schools, you love teaching. Yep. You love teaching. Uh, and, and that is very apparent. It was apparent when you used to coach our teams, it was, it's apparent. Uh, okay. So. I, I will say though, uh, dad, you get that from him because you always said if you weren't going to be a comic, you were going to be a teacher. He was a, he was a great, you asked, you asked grandma, cause I didn't see this, but during the summer he has a, he had a job of T-ball. Yeah. I coached a T-ball, t-ball for team. the town. Yeah. He, the kids love the experience. Well, look, coming from the kid who had him as his coach for the first 12 years Dude. of his life and watching him take a, a literal team of bad news bears <laughs> every year to a trophy and having fun all the way through. There were kids who were on some of those teams, you know, because in every league, there's always a couple kids whose parents were like, you're playing a sport this year. Pick one. And we would, my dad always on purpose picked those kids to be on our team. Because he always wanted to make it a memorable experience for them. And then the next year, they wanted to come back and play again. I remember growing up how much fun anybody who ever played on a Josh Wolf baseball team, they remember it. I have kids who come up to me who I haven't seen in over a decade. And they're like, how's Pops? Is he coaching mm-hmm. baseball anywhere? I, can't, I, I never forgot that team. I always had so much fun. Dude, at the end of practices, after we worked hard, fundamentals, we'd all go in the outfield. This is one of my favorites. We'd all go in the outfield. We'd each get two baseballs. And he would put the bucket that he would put the baseballs in at home plate. He says, if one of you hits this on a one bounce or on the fly, everybody gets free ice cream. But we did games every, every practice. Best part, none of us ever hit the bucket. No, I felt pretty good. But you know what happened? <laughs> but you, you had know, less money than we did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know what he still did every now and then? He still bought us ice cream. Yeah. And it was just like, it was always such a, such a, a, a really memorable experience all the way around i think he learned that from me yes i made i made drills mm, fun, fun. Yeah. and you know, yes yeah. it's uh and and he um he dealt with parents and helped them some parents there weren't a lot it's the same here he dealt with the parents and made them understand that the kid was not going to be a professional baseball yeah. As a matter of fact, he wasn't going to play junior high school baseball mm, either. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people I said, hey, you know, your kid's not Derek Jeter. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's not even Derek he's, Johnson. He's not even, yeah. 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 He's yeah. not Bob Jeter. He's yeah. nobody. He's just got a glove. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and at your age, even at your age when you were playing, it was dangerous for some of those kids to be out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. It, it's, you're, you're not playing with a mushy ball, a tennis yeah, ball. ball. No, it, it's yeah. If there were some kids who were daydreaming, did, did, did when you left, uh, your childhood was, and I, maybe it's a different perspective than, than it is now. 
Because I think everybody was like, well, I'm just going to get married and have kids. Like, isn't that, that was, I think that's different than it is now, but was, was being, I don't, yeah, I think it's. Uh, I, I would disagree with that. I still, you think everybody. No, think not everybody, but in, I will say, I think for sure in certain parts of the country, there are times and there are people who are like 18 right out of high school yeah. are getting married and having kids. And that's just I, how they're I, I didn't say it was a, raised kind but, of thing. Right. And that's but, that. The, it's we don't want to talk about that yeah. because that's a really interesting um, trend. When you look at boys and men, women are getting married later. Um, some women are not. Same amount of percentage of women are getting married this is an interesting sociological thing that's happened in this country. Did you always want to be a parent? No. I did not want to be a parent. Right. Okay. I think your point about what happened next was in a, you know, was in here unconsciously. Yeah. Okay. So. Did you, or were there anything that you found growing up that you can remember thinking something like, I'm never going to do it. If I'm, a, if I'm ever going to be a parent, I'm never going to do that. And then you found yourself doing it. Of course. Can you think but, of any of those? No, but you know, but I, I can, yes, the, I'm sure there is. Um, and, um, I, you, you know, sometimes you, I don't know if you did, but, um, you went out and visited Mike and Gary and Scott. Yep and went someplace and I would have Steve call me up and said, did you tell your, you or one of our kids would say something that I might say to you, you would say to his kids and he would call me up and say, did you tell them to do that? Or, you know, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, you, you know, you look, you don't have a say in who you are until maybe you're eight, nine, or 10. Yeah. Okay. So your parents had plenty of time to brainwash you. But dad, the difference, you know, there's a huge difference between parenting now and then. Yep. When you parented, when we came home from school, the outside influence was over. Right. From 3 p.m. to the next day when we went to school, you and mom were our influence. Absolutely. That's such a huge difference. They are influenced by other people 24 hours a day. And I would say their outside of influences are, are not only does it happen more often than the parents are influencing because they're on their phone so much, but it's all that peer pressure, that constant peer pressure. I, I is, it doesn't seem good. And it, it must be harder and harder for parents now to get part of them in. Okay. Yeah. What I, am I, what I, am I, yeah. I, what? I would say, Definitely, because like as a kid growing up with social media, like you obviously are going to, you know, listen to your parents and or hopefully listen to your parents and they haven't influenced you on some sort of way. But but having having everything in your hand all at once, being able to see the people you look up to, the people you don't like, the people you like and and taking everything that they're doing and comparing yourself to others and. It's just a constant that constant comparison. It's a is. constant self-deprecation unless you are happy with who you are as a person. Yeah. So it's that constant self-judgment of who you want to be, who you don't want to be, and who you are. You're always kind of stuck in that middle, wanting to be who you want to be, but always feeling like you're going back towards who you don't want to be. Well, it's you know when I see adults go out to eat and sit down and take out their phones, mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, why did you go out to eat? Yeah. yeah. You could go into the kitchen and fix yourself something because your partner is out there on the phone. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, I'm paranoid about social media and AI is not making me any happier. Yeah. I don't, um, I don't like AI either. And the other thing that you have to remember is when you sit down and read something, you have to be actively involved in the reading. When you do this, when you go to a movie, okay, a guy named Marshall McLuhan hit, had it hit the nail on the head when he talked about that kind of media is aggressive. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The light, everything, emotions, you are not doing anything. When you take out that phone, you are not doing anything yeah, as you. Okay. okay. And I, I'm, this, this, comp, this country has gone from a free market economy to capitalism. And capitalism means there has to be winners and losers. And the people who are the elites in capitalism, they am sure they want to keep you as losers in terms right. of the cash. That's way off of your question, but you're rubbing a yeah. sore that I'm very sore about. <laughs> yeah. Now, as a parent, a parent of four boys, which I couldn't imagine was super uh easy or the most nice smelling house of all time. <laughs> um, do, do you have any, uh, I guess not regrets, but do you have anything you wish you would have done as a parent or wish you wouldn't have done when you parented those huh. four kids? And I'm going to follow up with a question. Is there anything you want to let him answer that one first and then we'll get to the follow up? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's a tough question. Um, I look at the kids and I say, I could have some, done some stuff better. We could have done some stuff better. Um, you know, in, I guess if you, if I had a regret, it would be that I didn't talk to you guys more. Um, mostly because I was, I was who I was. Um, we talk, now we talk, mm -hmm. okay. Um, but I wish I had been more open, okay. Do I beat myself over the head with it? I can't. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you when it felt like you became more open to talking is when Papa died. It really, I think I had talked to Dan about this. There was a little bit of a shift in you, in your emotions and how you showed your emotion. I, I don't know if that was conscious or something that happened unconsciously, but it, there was a little bit of a shift that when it started to shift, when Papa passed away, I definitely noticed more communication, more emotion. It was an interesting, and I, I, I didn't know if you, that was like conscious decision on your part or just something that might've just uh, come about. Um, you're probably right. I didn't recognize it. Yeah. Okay. Um, you had a great, would you say you had a great relationship with your parents? I said it. Well, yeah, I did. Um, it was tough to have a relationship with dad. How come? Well, he was more buttoned up. Um, but and he, out and, in public, he wasn't. Let's see. That's not how, that's not my memory of him. You know, he was, when he walked into a party, people went, Charlie! So I never saw him as buttoned up. Yeah. There's a public face. Yeah. And a private face. And you would, I am always impressed by people whose face is the same all the time. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. Yours is. Yeah, yeah, I've learned. You, I've, I've learned. You too. That. Um, so that, in that way, when that happens, uh, I feel comfortable having been a parent or still being a parent. Um, it really never ends. <laughs> kid, it really never. He's well, just he's just a big kid. You got to parent him sometimes too. Still, Nana was. You know, if Nana and Booby had been your age now, they probably would have been chairpersons of a big company. No Both. doubt in my mind. It's so interesting, especially that generation, to have both you and mom come from families where the strength Ma might not be the right word. Matriarchal, really. Without a doubt. Both both Booby and Nana were strong, no fuck about 
women. I used to have to tell Nana that she um, she was slowing down. She only had enough power to provide light to the Cleveland, yeah. <laughs> New York City. It, Dad, is there anything? And I and I when I talk to other people who are parents, I'm always I I'm I'm always curious about this because I could tell you what it is for me. Is there anything that you're glad? Like you were like, man, I hope they get this from me. And is there anything where you're like, man, I hope they don't take this part of me? Well, the, let me. As far as parenting. Yeah. I I have come to see the word proud or glad or whatever, not glad, but proud is to assume that I had something greater to do with it than I think. I am very respectful of the fact that all four of you will take responsibility for your choices. Exceedingly respectful. Just so you know, that comes from you and mom. There's no way all four of us get it without seeing it. Right. But am I, am I respectful that it worked out that way? Yeah. You still have to make the choice. Okay. Mm-hmm. You got to remember that. Um, it's, you know, 2% us and 98% you. That's the way I figure it. it. Interesting, you know, because my theory on kids and babies is that a couple things. One, your job is not to fuck them up. Babies come out basically 98% good. The other stuff is things that the world or you heap on them. But there, most babies, and some are sociopaths, and you can't do anything about that, but most kids are born good. It's, it's our job to, to not fuck that up. They're born empty. But, but, but not empty, Dad, because that, that early laugh uh-huh. is a pure joy that comes from here. It comes from not being... But they... We might differ on this. The point is that um, who they are literally is in the air they breathe. Yes. Um, because they don't have any choice about it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I used to say to parents and to teachers, kids, I would say who you are is a, is the air you breathe. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you learn to control your breathing, okay, that's when um, you begin to be a, a person on your own right. Um, you, you know, I can tell you for me, like, and a lot of people that I've asked that question to, a lot of the things, a lot of times it's the same thing. I'm happy they got this. So for me, for for Jacob, for example, or for Caitlin and I'm I'm what I'm bummed that they did get from me and I'm, I'm just getting out of this now is that they're too nice and sometimes nice in a way where that puts you second. They're too, they're learning to be kind and respectful of yourself and other people is different than being nice. And a lot of times being nice puts you second and people take advantage of that. Yeah. And, and not being able to say no because you're worried about all that stuff. That's being nice. And I like, I wish I hadn't, that's not what they picked up from me at the same time. I'm glad they're good people and nice to other people. Right. It's like the same. It's just like, you know, um, when people like a, a good parent, better parent, I don't subscribe to that anymore because people do the best they can. And for every good parent. So say you have this parent, this kid is so they go to piano class and then they do three hours of homework and then they, this is all set and they're in bed and they brush their own hair and they're, yeah. And they're structured and they're amazing at it, but wait till dinner's at six instead of five and they lose their fucking shit and they have no flow. They can't flow. On the other hand, my kids can flow, but the structure part, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it depends on what's important to you is assigning good and bad for parenting. Mm-hmm. There, there's for every, positive thing there's not negative but there's an opposite side to it Mm. yeah yeah you're talking about saying yes or you know 
Yeah. Subjugating your own ideas. M- my goal in or hope in any relationship is that it's one and one. That that in relationships there doesn't have to be a winner and a loser. Yeah. Now I I read um and a lot of people feel, and that's what capitalism is about, is there's got to be a winner, okay? And you have uh, philosophies or sciences based upon, um, you know, there are people who tell you that the only thing that is innate to us is to get our seeds into the next generation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, my feeling about it is that um, good or bad, not good or bad, they are who they are. Um, yes, I agree. And uh, it's not like I'm abdicating responsibility, but you can't beat yourself up or take too much credit for other people's actions. Well, that's true. That's that's interesting. What would be your best parenting advice? New parents, parents who have had kids for you know however many years. What would be your best advice in any realm to people who are about to have kids? Love them unconditionally. Support them. Do not try to make the world safe for them. Okay. You know, wait till you see what they want for themselves, not what you want for them. These are all good. Yeah. Yeah. The safe one. Yeah. The, the safe one is like what you, what you did for me when I was a kid, which is you let me make my own mistakes. Like, you know, the stove was hot and I went to touch it. And most parents would be like, don't touch that. But he was like, well, he's going to find out it's hot either way. And guess what I never did after that? Touch the stove. Yeah. And the, the, that's a good way to do it. And the other way to do it is what Ellen and I did. Anything breakable, which, you know, our house, because there were four boys, was a pretty barren place. Especially that hole in the dining room floor right. where I dropped the keg. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, but yeah, if you, if you don't want somebody, kids, Touch the stove. Make try to make sure that it's off most of the time, unless you're standing in front of it. Yeah, right. or just leave it on for them as a trap. <laughs> um, and and another one from from how your parents raised you. Did you take anything? Did you take anything from how they raised you and and put it into how you raised your kids? Like he asked the question earlier, was you know you saw something your parents did and you said I'm never going to do that, but you did it anyways. Is there something that you purposefully took from your parents and how they raised you and put it to raising your four boys? I don't know how purposeful it was. It just became me. Okay. Take responsibility for what you do. And treat people as people. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we, that's something, that, I mean, think we did with you guys too um at at one point in time you stopped talking to us like we were kids that's what it was at one point in time you started talking to us like we were people and not just kids of a or people of a younger age who didn't understand the world like you did yeah consider this jacob okay he never stopped talking to you that way you got to an age where you could hear it that's really interesting Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't do that, you wouldn't have heard it. Yeah, that's true. Okay. All right. You know, I, uh, we grew up being outside and playing sports and, you know, I will say, I think, and we didn't have any money really growing up. <laughs> I think not having the money growing up. I think raking the leaves and shoveling the driveways and getting the ice off the car and chopping the wood and mowing the lawn, all that shit. 
I think, and I hated it. The list of chores where we couldn't leave a house until we were done with the chores. Fucking hated it. I'm so glad that was us. I'm so glad that I grew up like that. I'm, I am, it, I'm not afraid of work. I'm not afraid of work. None of those, none of your brothers are afraid of work. But I know, but in, but because we grew up working, I, I had a, I worked at the gaslight diner. I washed dishes at 14 years old. I was not afraid of work because there wasn't this, it wasn't like the big, bad boogeyman. It was just you. This was part of the deal with being in this family. And this was part of your responsibility. And it was such a good lesson. It was such a good lesson that also some things, you know, that shovel in that driveway, especially after the plow came down the street and they had pushed all of the fucking snow to the top of that driveway. <laughs> uh, but I'm not afraid of hard work. I, it, I will tell you something else. Between that and I think it was probably both you and mom. Your example of physicality in the world and, and doing physical things and being active. I, that stuck with me probably in a little bit of an obsessive way. But those two things about work and the physicality and to move your body are two things that I, I know came from both of you. You know, we, we talk about grandpa's athletic ability. He, he, you're five. Well, I don't know if you're five ten anymore, but you may be five eight ish now, and and not going the right not going way. in the right direction. Yeah, but at five ten, you were dunking a bat. You could dunk a basketball. Yeah, okay, uh, which is pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, dunk. he's six nine, <laughs> six two. Relax. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but um, you know you the the and but my mom her physicality. You know, I remember her flexing her muscle for me when we were, when I was probably eight or nine. And I was thinking, God damn, she had like a, bi like a legit bicep. You should have asked her to do that with her left arm. Really? Yeah. yeah. Nothing there. Oh, really? <laughs> I, is, thought he, I thought he was going to say oh, She was, went pure righty on yeah, it. She is oh, so right here. Yeah. You can hardly believe it. Mine I'm, too, I'm the, the same way. Mine too. I'm absolutely the same way. But I really... The, you know, just walking about my day, those two things, uh, the response to this, I would say the three things that I really, I are still with me every day is accountability and responsibility, but hard work and the, the physicality and keeping your body moving are, I know three things for me that have really stayed with me. And the importance of family, I, the importance of family and, um, being there for your kids are things that like are such in the forefront of my brain every day, but for sure, because of you. And I would say something else, not because of any conversation that me, you and mom had, we just did it. it was from watching you. We just, did it. we just did it. Yeah. It was pretty, I mean, because he thinks I'm psychotic in the gym. You are not think you are psychotic in a gym. And I, and looking now, I probably need to slow down a little bit in what I'm doing. How long have I been saying that? A long time. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I, it's what I watched growing up. It's what I watched growing up. So I think that's, you know, I, I catch myself more and more in my life being like, no, that's from my mom or Remember that's that? from my Remember dad. That came from. Yeah. Um, so Jacob, uh, we didn't have much money, but we did invest in two um, wood stoves. Okay, you know what a wood stove is? I think so. A wood it's stove a is basically a, a fire, a, a log burning stove that you would put in your house, and it would heat the house because yeah. we didn't. It was it's less like expensive than running day. the yeah. yeah yeah. So, and the least expensive way of that was to get the, you know, if you've in a logging action, you realize that 
the logs that are produced, lumber is produced, is first the bark is taken off the strips, okay, you can run the wood through, mm-hmm. and then you get your two by fours, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But what are you going to do with those things, the round things, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, s- some smart company said start selling them as wood, okay? So, I would order a truckload of those things. When I would see that truck, a lot. Uh, and they would come, and they dump it on our lawn, and it was hmm, this high, and probably anyway, it was enough for a year for us. Dang. Only thing that had to be sawed and stacked and split. And stacked. So when it arrived, I got a um, thing that's splitter. I got a splitter and um, I had a chainsaw. Okay. So wood got split, it got stacked. Um, anyway, the four of the five of us were able to do a truckload before lunch for the year. Pretty good. But we would stack that in the backyard and put it under plastic. Yeah. And then yeah. sometimes you had to go out in the morning with snow, like up to your knee and go get the fucking wood from the backyard. But this day, this morning, okay, the only time people got to rest was when my chainsaw ran out of gas. <laughs> So the kids, <laughs> I would be cutting. It wasn't as if I was sitting there with yeah. a whip. I was cutting. Yep. They was, and the two little ones were the ones that had to take the proper pieces back to the wood pile. Okay. So that was the extreme example of making the house. Hmm. Yeah. Can you... Share with him, and then we should probably get going because we all have to go to dinner. Yeah, I got to go back and shower and pick up Iman and then drive 30 minutes to you guys. Can you share with him maybe a story that he may not know or that you think is uh, funny or poignant or anything from growing up um, that you... I don't know, find it found important or, or that you remember, or that was funny or anything like that. Do you have any that spring to mind? I'm going to tell you a story about your dad. Oh, love it. Just, just, just more ammo for my arsenal. I guess I want to make a joke out of it. Okay. We are driving home. This is licensed, but somehow, oh, the, he and Jonathan really got pissed at me one day because they got invited to a party. And I called up to mom and dad. I said, are you going to be there? I know we're going. I said, are you going to be home Saturday night? No, we're wherever they were going. And I said, well, well Beck, you guys aren't going. The other thing you get him to tell you about when we went to Israel, what went on, you, you need to full the closure on that one. I might have thrown a couple big parties. Um, Was that the one where the keg went through the ground? Yeah. yeah. I've heard that story okay. before. <laughs> where grandma noticed that the yeah. rug was 60. Yeah. 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 Was this yeah. Far. yeah. I, I've heard that story before. Yo, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, Not she'll me. never notice. It's yeah, the first yeah. thing she said when she walked in the house. Why is the rug over there? Like, yeah. What the fuck? I, hey, if... <laughs> If it you was, wouldn't have noticed. I, never. <laughs> if, if you'd have told me today, it would have been a surprise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so we are driving home one night. and He's a senior. And I went to get him at a function. We're driving home. It's late at night. There's just two of us in the car. And I hear from the front seat, man, I wish I could do this forever. And I'm thinking to myself, well, would do this meaning high school? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I knew, wish this was the last forever. I'm thinking, well, what happened was, and I don't know how this is shaped 
his life, but I think it was significant. Two things happened. He got into no colleges, applied late. Um, and we, yeah, Grandma and I, got him into a prep school, private prep school. Okay. And that was tough for him. Um, it was, honestly speaking, a personal failure, not because he couldn't, but he didn't. Big difference. And By the then, way, that affected me more. Couldn't is not something that I would would harsh myself on. Didn't is something that sticks with you. Exactly. Yeah. And then he met a feisty young woman guidance counselor who in his first meeting so much as told him he was full of shit. First person who had ever said that to me. He That's, was, it's it, life-changing. It was. I don't know. I wasn't in the meeting, but she told me. About it. I mean, we got, you know, we had a conference with her, and I'm thinking to myself, man, if I could have personally designed the person who was going to sit in this office and deal with Josh, she would have been it. So at that moment, and nothing we did, um, the, what he didn't do and what she made him look at about where he was, he took getting into college seriously. Now, once he got there, I can't say. <laughs> uh, all I can tell you, Josh, is I know, I know that when his group graduated, because one of the women told me, the deans had a party. I uh, bet they did. <laughs> They had a brief celebra celebratory party for these troop of guys. And one of his roommates' mom, who's not, you know, not there, blamed him for leading. Oh, the charge. What, yeah. Well, she thought I was the one who brought the goat. By the way, that's a long story, the yeah, goat. We'll talk about that. Okay, um, yeah. Um, I'll tell you something wh which was not lost on me, by the way. And I don't know if I've ever told you this. But. I knew we didn't have any money. And I knew that that prep school was, was a f big deal for you guys to send me to. And that was the first check-in with myself where I was like, I got to get my shit together. Like they are going to the mat for me. They are spending more than they planned on. Could. Or, and, uh, and, you know, and that was a, my first real personal responsibility where I was like, yo, this is, this is not okay. Yeah. That, that my fuck off has put such a burden on these people who I know would do anything for me, mm. but that's not my job to take advantage of that. And I, I, I remember, not only do I remember without a doubt being the poorest person at that school. Do you remember we, so we couldn't really, if we pulled up in a giant van that said rent a wreck on the side. Do you remember that? Yeah. Pulling up to that school around those fucking richy rich kids oh. in that rent a wreck van. It said rent a wreck on the side of it, dude. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Hey, I was, paste to when, advertise. When I got out of that van, all of the, I remembered those Richie Riches looking at me like, who is this fucking kid? And I remember getting into my room and I'm so glad I was with this first kid. I ended up switching roommates mid semester, but he was just this Eastern mass Southie. And he was just like fucking uh, rent a wreck, huh? And I was like, oh, this is going to be a long... He called me rent a wreck Bummer. for the first two weeks. Yeah. Hey, rent a wreck! I was yeah. like, okay. It, but everybody on that campus knew I was the kid who drove up in the rent a wreck van. Hey, well, I will it, say, but, it's, not but, a, it's not a good first impression, but at least everybody knew who you were on the first day of school. But I will tell you, I, it was also one of the first times where I took something that embarrassed me, that I was ashamed about. 
and turned it around into funny and and in a positive. Mm -hmm. It was a, early on. He got along very well by the end of the year. Yes. You, you made some lifelong. Time. Yes. And incidentally, he talks about the keg. Ellen and I knew that that party probably wouldn't have taken place if he didn't need the money and didn't want to ask us for the spending money for the second semester. That's true. Absolutely, 100%. And, you know, we truly appreciate that. Mm. Um, but you probably spent more fixing the hole in the floor than you would have. No, I, me, <laughs> I just moved the rug over. Yeah. <laughs> I got... I got the same problem. Mom <laughs> discovered a little gouge in one of the in one of the pavers. Yeah, and the, she wants to get it fixed. I'm thinking to myself, you don't fix that. Yeah, you, you know, if somebody wants to offer you fifty dollars less for the house when we sell it, fine. fine. But I'm not. Do you have anything else, Randy? I got nothing else. I think we. I really covered all of our. Do you have anything? Um, just observationally or that you want to chime in before I... I can see why you raised me the way you did. I can see where you got a lot of your morals from and a lot of parenting... I'm not going to say skills, but parenting uh, uh, ad advice and um, and you had a good, a good example to go off of, you know? Both my mom and dad. Yeah. I, I will tell you that, you know... It me calling and asking their advice hasn't ended. I mean, there were times, yeah, there were many times. You know, you were growing up, or your brother and sister, where I was like, I think I know what I want to do. Even now, man, I think I know what I want to do. But who else would I ask? Yeah, absolutely for their opinion. Absolutely, and you, you, I hope that what we've done is just offer a mirror and options, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever you decide, you decide we support. I, I, there are times in my life and I won't mention them where I know you must've been at the house. Like what the fuck is he doing? What is he doing? And, and I appreciate you guys keeping that basically to your selves. You, as parents, have never overstepped your bounds. As parents, it's not, you never, yo, dude, I know people's parents, when they come visit at the house, the parents sleep in the bed and the, because, and then the kids or the, their kids have to sleep on the couch. That has never, they've never inserted or asserted themselves in that way. And as it, people who give advice either. They, it, it's been, it's remarkable. Um, and, um, I really appreciate, I, I, uh, as I've gotten older, I, I, and again, I write about it every day. I'm super grateful for both you and mom and, and everything that you taught me and everything, the sponge part that I picked up from you. Um, I, I think about it so much more now as I get older, like, wow, I just, if I'll, I'll, something will happen, I'll be like that for a hundred percent was my dad, a hundred percent, or that was just like my mom. And so I, I think between the two of you, cause you're completely, not completely, but you're different people. I got a great, I got a great Mix. combination. Yeah. I got a great combination and, it, it, and, um, yeah, yeah, it was pretty amazing. I, 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 I'm so glad that you, we got to do with this with you and the first, because this podcast and talking about people's childhood and then their parenting. This could be a four-hour podcast every day. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, there's so many other things that I want to get to. We could do just an hour on how they were raised and how they raised their kids. Yeah, like, that's it's what I'm it's it so go either way. There's a chance that we might talk to you again. But is there anything that you would like to say? Yeah, I want to say something about my parents. Helen and I came into Beth and Art's lifelong friends. Beth and Art are his parents truly best friends okay yeah. and the group sitting around the dining room table and i don't know who but one of them have brought in um a question um, 
say something about your other. Okay, can can you whisper some other to me? And um, then they read it. Okay. <laughs> Can't say tell it's hearing. They each said that they were each other's best friend. <sighs> Independently, without... Without any... Yeah. But they were. Yeah, they were. And I will say, I, I see that in you and Grandma also. I can see, I see that relationship and friendship and love every time I see you guys. It is very apparent. And, and I see how important it is to you two to not only be each other's partner, but each other's best friend throughout life. Right. And one of the things I think does that is, I've, so I don't know if I've told you, but I think I have, is that every partnership has three parts. The partner, the partner, and the relationship. And all three have to have the freedom to grow, develop. Um, it's interesting you say that. Somebody was asking me about, you know, Beth and I and the secret. And I was like, I don't know if there's any secret, but I can tell you this, that we've allowed each other to grow because that's what happens in your life. You are, are together, but you also have parts of your life where you're separate. So you're not growing exactly the same in the same direction all the time, but we allow each other to grow. And then as a, as a couple, we check in on that growth. So the relationship doesn't suffer from the, from how we're each also living our lives. It grows because you are growing. Okay. There's a lot that's been written. Uh, one of my favorite books, English major, um, and it's a book I taught. A book is something people Stop read. it. I know what it is. Okay. It's called The Bridge Over St. Louis Ray. Um, and in it, there's a passage where Wilder says, in every relationship, there's one person who loves more than the other. And when you look at relationships, um, that's not, he says it happens all the time. Um, I'm hoping that it doesn't. I, I saw it not happen with my proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we were just talking about this in a, another group I was in, uh, the novel reading group. Anyway, y you would hope that those three things grow proportionately all right you got anything no um that was that was a pretty pretty outstanding yeah mm -hmm. i love you thank you so much for doing this um yeah uh we jacob and i will be in dania beach you when you to, hear this you want me to handle the business like it kind of looks like that that last 10 minutes set you up for yeah, handle emotion. It. I got it. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, first and foremost, Grandpa, thank you so much for coming out here and doing this with us. This was outstanding and amazing to see people come up to us all the time and say, we'd love to see how you and your dad talk. That's what I was so excited about today was just to watch you guys have conversations that dad and I have. So first and foremost, thank you so much for coming on here. This was amazing. We love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ComedianJoshWolf.com for tour dates and tickets. We're going to be in Dania Beach, Florida this weekend on Valentine's Day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, it's, you know, we're going to be in a city near you. We're everywhere every weekend up until June. So come see us. Uh, Josh Wolf Comedy on all platforms. Uh, it's Jake Wolf on TikTok and Jake underscore Wolf on Instagram. Thank you guys always for tuning in. Can't wait to see what this evolves into. And, okay. I got one thing. I know I shot my special two weeks ago, but if you ask the people in Buffalo how the shows were this weekend, they were fucking fire. I already have an hour 15, an hour 20 mm -hmm. that is ready to rock, everybody. So come out. The mater new material is whew, smoking. Tell somebody you love them. Do something nice for someone today. We'll see y'all next week.